Okay, Naimi, the floor is yours. Thanks, George. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining this session and apologies for uh, the delay. Uh, there was a technical glitch, but I'm glad that you are able to join and watch us on YouTube as well. In the next 90 minutes, uh, we'll explore the current state of corporate human rights performance as per the latest CHRB report, focusing particularly on Asia and the Pacific region. Just taking you through the agenda briefly, uh, we'll start with Camille presenting the CHRB 2019 results, followed by a question and answer round and quick remarks by three of our speakers who are present with us. We will then get into the methodology consultation, which Camille will explain shortly, followed by remarks from the speakers and question and answers from all of you. I would also like to remind you about uh, some housekeeping items. Uh, I would recommend that you use the speaker view uh, instead of uh, the gallery view from the top right corner of your Zoom screen. Uh, you could al alternatively also use uh, to hide non-video uh, participants uh, uh, from the button on the top of your Zoom screen. We would like this session to be interactive and I will invite participants to sharing your views uh, in the chat box uh, and participating in the polls that we will run through. I'll just introduce myself and then uh, my colleague, uh, Camille. My name is Namit. I work for World Benchmarking Alliance. I look at Asia uh, public policy, engaging with uh, governments and investors and stakeholders in the Asia region. Camille leads the corporate human rights benchmark at WBA, and she's joined CHRB in October 2016 and has the overall responsibility for producing methodologies and benchmark reports. With this, I would like to hand over to uh, Camille. Camille, over to you. Great, thank you, Namit. Um, good afternoon, good morning to all of you. So as Namit just said, my name is Camille Laporce and I lead the CHRB within the World Benchmarking Alliance. For the next 15 minutes or so, I will give a brief overview of the CHRB's approach and of the latest results published in 2019 with a special focus on Asia and the Pacific. So first, a few words about the CHRB for those not familiar with it. So we benchmark the largest global companies from high risk sectors on their human rights performance. And we are part, as Namit said, of the larger World Benchmarking Alliance or WBA. The mission of the WBA is to benchmark 2,000 of the largest and most influential global companies on their contribution to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. We are multi-stakeholder, so the CHRB was initially set up by a group of like-minded civil society organisations, institutional investors and human rights experts who wanted to produce the first public benchmark of corporate human rights performance. The WBA also has a multi-stakeholder component through its alliance, which is founded on a belief in the power of cross-sector partnerships to drive systemic progress. And the CHRB has published three benchmarks to date, one in 2017, another one in 2018, and the most recent one in 2019. So some information about the CHRB's approach. We currently look at four sectors, agricultural products, apparel, extractives, and ICT manufacturing. And we also added automotive manufacturing in 2020. We rely on a methodology framed around six measurement areas um, that companies are assessed against and that you can see on screen, governance and policies, embedding respect and human rights due diligence, remedies and grievance mechanisms, company human rights practices, responses to serious allegations and transparency. So 2019 was our third cycle and we published the 2019 results in mid-November. We added 100 companies in 2019 and that brought the total number of companies up to 200. Each company is assessed on about 50 indicators, 
and the methodology is grounded on the UN guiding principles and other internationally recognized instruments. And I'm sure those of you who are familiar with the UNGPs will have recognized um, in our measurement themes the, the framework of the GPs. We look exclusively at publicly available information in our assessment and nearly two thirds of companies engage with us. So engagement is optional given that we rely on public information, but we do find it very helpful to be able to have this direct dialogue and conversation with companies and we're hoping to increase the engagement rate going forward. So as I said, we had 200 companies in scope in 2019 and more than a quarter of these are headquartered in the Asia Pacific region. Um, with in Australia, six companies, 11 companies headquartered in China, three companies in Hong Kong, four in India, 18 in Japan, one in Singapore, three in South Korea, three in Taiwan, and two in Thailand. In 2020, so this year, the number of companies headquartered in the region will go up to 74, as we added new companies to cover the automotive industry and the results will be published in November of this year. But so essentially out of 200 companies in total last year, over a quarter of them were headquartered in the region. Um, okay, so that's probably enough for the general framing and overview of the process. Now let's take a look at the results. I think the slides might have dropped off the screen, so I'll just try to upload them again. Okay, can everyone see them again now? Yeah, okay, great. So these were for the companies in scope. And now looking at the results. So these were launched at Aviva Investors in London in mid-November last year, and then followed by another launch on Human Rights Day hosted by BlackRock in New York. And the reason I'm highlighting this is that investors are a key audience for us um, as a user of the data. So on the slide, you can see the distribution of all 200 companies assessed last year. Um, these are the results across all companies, so not just the Asia Pacific region, to give you an idea of the overall picture. What you can see on the graph is the number of companies in each scoring band, bearing in mind that the maximum score would be 100. So for example, looking at the column furthest to the left, we see that 49 companies scored between zero and 10%. So again, this is 49 out of 200, so nearly a quarter of companies scoring under 10%. The key number is 24%, that's the average total score. And I've also included the average for companies headquartered in the Asia Pacific region, region for comparison, um, so that's 18%, so a bit less, and we'll look at these in more detail in a minute. But overall, these results were slightly lower than in 2018, and over half of companies scored less than 20%. So the distribution is clearly skewed towards the lower bands, with a long tail stretching towards 90%, and no companies scoring above 90%. These low scores are, of course, very concerning because they signal low levels of implementation of the UNGPs by major companies in high risk sectors. And looking at the measurement theme level, you can see that scores are actually consistently low across the different measurement areas, um, suggesting weakness across these different areas. So looking a bit more closely at the results for the Asia and Pacific region, here is the ranking based on the 2019 results. Again, the average score for the region is lower than the global average, but this hides significant disparities within the region with, for example, 16% average for Japanese and Indian companies, 4% for Chinese companies, 46% for Australian companies and 24% for South Korean companies. So really big disparities within the region. 
it's important to highlight, um, however, that to get <clears throat> a more comprehensive picture of business and human rights in the Asia Pacific region, we do need to look beyond companies headquartered in the region. Um, so in this regard, the global results, which I described uh, a moment ago, can also tell us about the situation in the region, given the reliance on of these companies on global supply chains. So I'll come back to this later, uh, but before I do so, I wanted to show you the results at sector level, um, taking agri agricultural products as an example. So I won't go into too much detail now, and we'll only show a slide on agricultural products companies to give you an idea of the results at sector level um, and information on the other sectors is covered and fully available online. So looking at agricultural, pro agricultural products, we added 19 companies last year, and these are represented in red on the slide, whereas those in blue are repeat companies, so that's companies that had been benchmarked previously in 2017 and 2018. Um, and as you can see, the new companies are heavily in the lower bands, which drops the overall average down for the sector, despite progress for those companies that had been previously included. For each sector, we publish banding tables with company score changes where applicable. So depending on whether the company was new or a repeat company. So on the table, you can see some red flags. These indicate um, that there was at least one allegation meeting the severity threshold uh, against that specific company. The X's uh, mark where we have not engaged, uh, sorry, where the company has not engaged with the CHRB or responded to a letter sent by an investor coalition following the 2018 results. And the exclamation marks uh, that you can see <clears throat> mostly for the company's lowest scoring um, is for companies that scored zero on all five human rights due diligence indicators. But enough with the bad news, or for now at least, we did see some progress. Um, so here's on the slide the initial original distribution in 2017. 18 months later, we are starting to see the distribution uh, shifting to the right. And in 2019, we saw an even greater shift. Um, just to highlight that this is looking at repeat companies only. So these companies that were in since 2017 through to 2019. So the average scores are going up each year for companies that were in since 2017 but we're a long way from a normal distribution around the 60% mark. And while there is some improvement at the moment, it's just too slow. So at this rate, it will be well, be well past 2030 before most companies would be what we might call good. And this also does not take account of the fact that new companies pull the average down and that the indicators may become more demanding over time. So to give you a concrete example, living wage, um, currently the requirement around living wage is for companies to have a target time frame for paying a living wage. Whereas we can imagine going forward that companies would need to have achieved paying a living wage in order to meet the requirements. So a few other key findings from the data um, that help the build the picture with an Asia Pacific focus. Just under 80% of companies headquartered in the region have at least a basic commi commitment to respect human rights. But nearly 60% of companies headquartered in the region scored zero on all human rights due diligence indicators, so no point at all across these five indicators. And this is particularly concerning given that human rights due diligence as a process a business is expected to follow in order to identify, assess and act upon its human rights risks should be at the heart of any good approach to managing human rights risks. So 60% scoring zero is concerning. Another finding is that less than nine, 
9% of companies in the region disclose that board remuneration is linked to human rights. So this is five companies out of 51. And actually for four out of them, this is only connected to health and safety, not to any other aspects of um, human rights. So this is an important point, given that we noticed that companies in which board members have financial incentives connected to human rights tend to score better overall. And in fact, companies disclosing that board remuneration is linked to human rights score 60% on average. Another key finding is that scores were particularly low in relation to bonded labor for apparel and agricultural product companies in relation to land rights for agricultural and extractive companies, and in relation to child labor for ICT manufacturing companies. And these findings mirror the findings at the global level. Another key finding is around supply chains. So going back to a point I made earlier around the state of business and human rights in the region, not depending only on companies headquartered in the region, given that many companies headquartered outside of Asia Pacific will have large supply chains that extend into the Asia Pacific region. So looking at the full set of companies in scope, we are seeing supply chain mapping increasing annually, but still a minority of companies disclosing A, that they map their supply chain internally without even necessarily disclosing it, and B, even fewer disclose information on the most relevant parts of their supply chains, that's information on who they use as suppliers. Building on this point, we saw looking at the 2019 data set that the majority of companies with allegations meeting our threshold were headquartered in OECD countries. But looking into the allegations um, themselves and where the negative impacts allegedly occurred, the countries with the highest numbers were India with 19 allegations, Indonesia with 16 and China with 15. So what we have is main, many OECD country companies with allegations of negative impacts occurring in their supply chains in countries like India, Indonesia and China. This is not to say, of course, that there are no negative impacts in OECD countries and no allegations against companies headquartered in Asia Pacific. And there are many factors impacting this, um, such as the media attention that is given to specific companies but this is definitely a trend that we saw in the data. And finally, still looking at the serious allegations data, we had almost 150 severe allegations reviewed in total. And companies demonstrated providing remedy that was satisfactory to the victims in only 3% of cases. So there is definitely still a huge gap when it comes to providing effective remedy. So that's a lot about the data from 2019 already. If you would like to learn more about the 2019 benchmark and dig deeper into the data set, here's how you can access the results. So all of them are publicly available, free to download on the CHRB website. What's available is a key findings report uh, with some analysis on the 2019 results. Banding tables, bar graphs and other infographics that help make sense of the data. Individual company scorecards. So for every company, we've got a scorecard with the detailed scores at indicator level. And for each of them, the score, the explanation and the sources that were used. We've got a master data sheet, um, which is essentially an Excel document with all the data in one place, all the raw data in different formats um, to enable people to play around with the data set, filter to any topics they're interested in, any companies they're interested in and look for best practice. These can be used to do several things. They can be used to get an overview of a company's performance or of a specific sector's performance, identify strengths and weaknesses, compare companies um, 
and identify best practice. So I'm going to stop here and hand over to Namit as we move into the first Q&A of the session. So over to you, Namit. Thanks, Camille. Thanks uh, for this presentation and explaining uh, the results. Uh, I don't see questions in the chat right now, but uh, if anybody has a question to ask, I did see someone uh, raising their hand. So if you have any questions or comments on the results, please put it on the chat box. I'll wait for a couple of seconds. Uh, Okay, so um, maybe then I'll, I'll just invite uh, our, our speakers, I'll introduce them and then uh, invite them to make some quick comments on the results. Uh, so we have three very distinguished speakers with us today. Uh, Livio Sarendria, uh, he's uh, in UNDP's Business and Human Rights uh, Asia. Uh, he's a global advisor uh, for Business and Human Rights in UNDP. And uh, most of you might have already seen him in the sessions this week, but he's undoubtedly Asia's most influential person on business and human rights. Uh, he's a lead advisor of the UNDP B plus HR program, which is operational in 11 Asian countries. So that's the kind of scope Libya is managing. We also have with us uh, Felicitas Weber, who works at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center since 2016. She leads the development of the Know the Chain project, ranking the 180 largest global ICT, food and beverage and apparel companies on their efforts to address forced labor in their supply chains. Then we have Hiroshi Ishida, who's the executive director of the Cox Roundtable Japan. Preceding the CRT Japan, he worked at the Industrial Bank of Japan for almost 10 years. With that, I would like to uh, invite Livio to first give his uh, comments and remarks on the CHRB results, followed by the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Namit. And thank you uh, to CHRB for, for inviting me. I, I am a, a big fan of the work CHRB is doing. I, I really don't miss opportunities to spread the word and tell people about what CHRB is doing. And, and these, these, these good comments are not the consequence of the <laughs> nice, uh, too kind comment that you have made on me, uh, Namit. But let, let me jump on, uh, on some reactions. Uh, I understood you want some reaction vis-a-vis -vis Asia. Obviously, globally, uh, the first feeling is, is of disappointment. I mean, the numbers uh, are disappointing globally. Perhaps when it comes to Asia even more, uh, Asia is, is uh, behind uh, the the global average, which is, which is not uh, very high either. Uh, very disappointing, of course, looking at 60% of the company scoring uh, zero on, on HRDD, uh, very alarming seeing a 3% on remedy. So generally the picture is, is not good. And generally what these numbers tell us is confirmed also by our own um, feeling in interacting with companies. And what is being confirmed is, is both the negative, if you like, but also the, the positive trend, uh, and, and if you like. Um, obviously, the, the, the baseline is very low. It's a baseline of um, bonded labor, child, child labor, uh, exploitation of migrant workers, exploitation of, of the environment, unfortunately. And, and of course, um, uh, suffering of specific categories, such as women, a person with disability and so on. So we start uh, all from a, from a baseline which is very low, we know. Uh, however, and again here I'm confirming the positive trend that somehow Camille highlighted, we are also seeing in, in, in Asia some progress. And, and the indicator I can offer is the one of the forum in which we are right now. Interestingly, we started with our forums when uh, CHRB started in 2017. We started in 2017 with our forum with, I believe, 10 or 12 companies being present and interested in, in business and human rights. We went up to 50, 100. This year we had almost a thousand uh, uh, representatives from companies involved. So the interest in business and human rights is growing. Interest in learning, interest in, in understanding what these, these uh, uh, standards um, are, and, and, and we also see a certain interest in putting these standards in practice. Now, 
how much this will impact, will, will, will result in impact on the rights holders remain to be seen. And again, we'll look at your data to tell us more about that. Let me, let me end by, by um, telling my view on why are these uh, numbers growing and why is the momentum growing. Number one, the awareness is growing. Um, and not only the general awareness, but the awareness uh, the human rights is good for business, at least in the long term. So the, the, this advocacy and this narrative around that is getting more companies attracted to. Number two, um, companies are, 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 are um, showing more interest in the, in, uh, in the guiding principles on business human rights because of policy work, national action plan on business human rights, governments putting in place policies that are going also global in the direction of mandatory human rights due diligence. So obviously companies are very tuned into what is this going to mean for us in terms of, of, of legality of our work. Uh, third point is the growing consumer pressure, also in Asia, obviously a lot more in, in Europe, but also growing uh, slowly in Asia. And the work that you are doing on benchmarking goes in that direction, so points to where gaps are and feeds the competitiveness that exists uh, among companies, should exist, the feeling of competitiveness that also in Asia is, is, uh, is very uh, strong. So that leads me to the centrality of communicating this. I'll come back to that later. These data are very important. The more they are um, communicated, the more there is awareness of this, the more these numbers feed the policy work, uh, the more the momentum will grow. I'll leave it at that, Namit, for now. Thanks, Libby. Very insightful comments uh, there. Uh, I will now uh, ask Felicitas to share her comments on the results. Thanks so much, Namit, and thanks so much, Camille, for um, that introduction. It was hugely helpful. Um, so we have just also done an assessment where we looked at the 60 largest global ICT companies, including 24 Asian companies. And what struck me really was that the results are so similar to um, the, sh the findings that Camille just shared. Um, so the fact that on overall, the bar is just really, really low, right? Like the average scores are low, both at a global, but also at an Asian level. Um, but then also that we see this massive um, gap between the policies on the one side and the sort of implementation on the other side. Um, so I think what is positive and what Livio mentioned as well, right, that there is an increasing awareness and actually the vast majority of the Asian companies we looked at do have a commitment to address forced labor and many, for example, also have a commitment to looking at, you know, addressing exploitation of migrant workers through recruitment agencies. But when it comes to the implementation side, the numbers drop significantly down. Um, we have, um, yeah, only seen even at a even at a global level, only a quarter of companies have any steps in place to remediate fees for workers, for example. Um, and for us, a really massive finding was as well that there is this gap on the what the CHAB calls the enabling rights. So we had all companies scoring zero on freedom of association and supporting that in supply chains. Um, and I think the one thing that um, I think is quite interesting that even though the corporate human rights benchmarks and many others, you know, look um, to a large extent at corporate data and corporate disclosure. Um, even by doing that, um, especially for the lower and the mid scoring companies, you can really easily um, you can really easily assess them and you don't even necessarily need to go beyond corporate disclosure and looking at allegations because as soon as you ask questions around what are outcomes for workers, what are concrete impacts for workers, there are barely any companies that can um, respond to that. Um, and one thing I wanted to also comment that is just this 20% of companies that don't improve over time. And also the fact that Camille was talking about, um, we are seeing improvements. And I think similarly on Node Chain, we're also seeing improvements from around 80% of the companies. But again, uh, very much mirroring what the CHB is finding is that the pace of change is much too slow. We'd want to see companies improving at a much higher level. Um, and, it, and that's not happening. So I do think, just thinking around how can we use these results as well to incentivize government action um, would be really interesting. Um, so in, in the case of Asia, for example, thinking about having data at a regional and national level and presented that way. Um, so for Node Chain, for example, we have published an Asian findings report in Chinese and one on Japanese companies in Japanese just to try to see 
um, how we can foster more comparison also at regional and national level and um, also try to get um, more action from governments. So I'll leave it at there for now. Thank you. Thanks, Felicitas. Very useful comments uh, and, and suggestions there. Uh, I would now invite Hiroshi for uh, his comments on the results. Okay, thank you, Namit, and thank you for the explanation of this methodology of the first introduction from Camille. My perspective of these comments about this result so far, from the company's perspective, maybe I should talk from the company's perspective because I'm in sort of working very closely with many Japanese companies how to deal with this human rights agenda. And the result, as Camille had explained, is totally, it's very understandable for the companies. They write their policies and they try to deal with the human uh, due, uh, due diligence procedures. But when it comes to this point, it's very, very difficult situation to how to handle. Even this morning, I visited a company and they told me they have more than 20,000 suppliers, million of workers. How can you reach and identify the human rights abuse? And then totally the company said one department, one section cannot afford. So that's also some of the Japanese company is still struggling in this F making an effort. But as Livia has also mentioned, the government and the civil society is now uh, monitoring this system and they are now giving a pressure so I feel more likely that the World Benchmark Alliance and the CHLB giving this kind of the guidance to these Japanese companies as well. And there's some of the leading companies will begin focusing on this point. So I think at this moment of the result is scaling a little bit moving ahead from like an average to 20%, 30%, 40%, I think it's, Still, it's very um, immature at the moment, but in the future, I think this progress we can see is going up to maybe 60% in the near future, by the time 2030. I think it's very understandable and easy for us to show the companies where are you heading for. So I think so far, I think I just leave this comment and the result itself is very, very on the route as well. It just identify the company situations. Thank you. Thanks, Hiroshi, for your optimistic comments. Uh, Camille, I will get back to you. Uh, and, and there's also one question on the methodology. So if you would like to address that question and move forward. Sure. <coughs> should I do, um, do you want to ask the question now, Namit, or should I move on yes, to the so next bit? The question is, how did you assign weights to the respective categories? Uh, and this is a question on the CHRB methodology. Weights to the uh, different measurement themes. Um, so these were decided based on so research and uh, multi-stakeholder consultations that were held when the methodology was initially developed. Um, and the reason we went for these weightings, so taking in, into account all these views was, so we had the policy commitment, human rights due diligence, and remedy aspects that came like very directly from the UN guiding principles. Um, so these were important to include, but we also wanted to have a fair amount of the score coming from more performance related indicators. So we've got 40% coming from performance, and that's split between human rights practices in relation to key human rights risks like child labor, forced labor, um, working hours, etc. Um, and responses to specific allegations of human rights impacts. Um, so yeah, it was really trying to get the, a mix and a balance between these more policy management systems oriented indicators and the more performance oriented ones. Um, in the context of the methodology review that we're doing this year, and I'm just going to talk about it now, that's a question we're asking is, should we change these um, different weightings going forward? And should we, for example, put more emphasis on performance? Um, so if the person who asked the question has any suggestions on this, or anyone else in the audience for that matter, then that would definitely be very welcome. 
Um, Thanks, wait, were Camille. there any other questions at this stage, Namit? Or? No, I think uh, there's one comment, but no more questions. But I would invite all the participants to uh, use the chat box to ask questions. Uh, we have designed this session to be very interactive, so it will only be helpful if you ask your questions or have uh, suggestions for us. With that, I would thank uh, uh, Livio, Felicitas, and Hiroshi for uh, very val valuable opening comments. Uh, we'll come back to you later during the uh, webinar to get more comments from you. But now over to you, Camille, uh, to talk about the next uh, steps. Great, thank you, Namit. So shaping the next benchmark. So now that we're all familiar with the benchmark and with the 2019 results, we would like to invite all of you to shape the benchmark going forward through sharing comments and suggestions for improving the CHRB's methodology and approach more generally. So as Namit said, please uh, do send your comments uh, and questions through the chat box. Um, so this year, the CHRB is conducting a year-long review of its methodology in parallel to the 2020 assessment. So for us, this review is an opportunity to ensure that um, the benchmark remains relevant and useful and that the framework is up to date and a cornerstone of both the WBA and the CHRB's approach is actively listening and responding to stakeholders as part of an ongoing engagement process to ensure relevance but also credibility. And so for this reason the 2020 review also relies on global multi-stakeholder consultations through which we're hoping to get inputs representing a diverse set of stakeholders and geographies. So this conversation today fits in this broader context of the methodology review and consultations. And this session for us is a great opportunity to hear from our speakers, but also from the wider audience. So again, really encourage you to participate and make suggestions. Um, so the way the rest of the session is going to work is that I'm going to provide a few comments to help shape and frame the discussion, supported by a few poll questions. Um, and we will then hear suggestions from Livio, Felicitas and Hiroshi with time for open comments and questions from the audience in between. So we're trying to keep it dynamic and interesting for everyone, especially as this is a Friday afternoon for many of you. Um, so for now, let me do a bit of framing to get the conversation started and please take part in the polls and send your comments in the chat box as I go through these. So in order to support the discussion, the CHRB team identified uh, possible questions grouped under four topics. We've got methodology, scope of the assessment, benchmark process and presentation of the results. And these are meant to support the consultation discussions, but should not be seen as exhaustive. So we welcome, of course, other comments and suggestions on other topics, if you have any. So on the methodology front, we're keen to hear comments on the overall structure. Um, so are there measure measurement themes uh, that should be given more or less weight? And this connects to the question we just had uh, from someone um, in the audience. But we're also interested in whether there may be topics that we do not currently cover that should be added. So, for example, there are key human rights risks particularly relevant to the Asia Pacific region. Are there any that we should consider including going forward that we're not currently including? And one topic that has received more attention in recent years is precarious or insecure work. Um, so this is our first poll question for you. So um, if the organisers could please get the poll question up, that would be great. Um, precarious work is characterised by, thank you very much, by um, high uncertainty over working hours and or contract lengths, low job security, lower salaries and limited social protection. So these are often associated with the gig economy and app-based work, but they're certainly not limited to these. Um, so our question to you is, do you view precarious work as a key human rights risk 
in the Asia Pacific context, but also beyond, and something that we should therefore um, consider adding to the CHRB methodology going forward. And so you can see possible answers. No, it's not a key risk. It is a key risk and CHRB should include it, or not sure, that's if you don't have a strong opinion on the question. I can see we've got answers coming in, which is great. I'll give a bit more time, uh, but already I can see a clear tendency towards, yes, it is a key risk and CHRB should include it. So do you view precarious work as a key human rights risk? that should be included in the CHRB methodology. Great, so perhaps I can leave, we can leave it open for a few more seconds. I can see that there are still a few people who didn't vote. Um, and then perhaps let's move on to the next one. Um, so another key question we are keen to receive insights on relates to business models. Um, and so this is our second poll question. Um, we know that some business models carry higher human rights risks than others. Um, for example, fast fashion is a good example of this. Um, so the question for you here would be, should the CHRB assess companies on how transparent they are about the human rights risks inherent to their business model? With possible answers being, yes, we should address this topic, no, we should not, not sure, if you don't know. Um, and one thing that could be interesting in the discussion later on is for those people who do think that we should address this topic, um, keen to hear their views on where would be the best place in the methodology to do so. Would it be, for example, under human rights due diligence? Because inherent risk to the business models is certainly a, an angle that can be used as part of a human rights due diligence process. Perhaps give a few more seconds on this one that I can see that we've got, again, a very clear tendency towards, yes, we should address this topic. Around business models. Great, so closing up on this um, methodology um, uh, kind of theme, um, as I said, any comments on the methodology, maybe on the overall structure, on the specific indicators, are very welcome. Now moving on to scope. So the 2020 methodology covers five industries agricultural products, apparel, extractives, ICT manufacturing, and automotive manufacturing. So some questions we want to explore here are, should the CHRB continue to benchmark the same sectors? Should new sectors be added instead or on top of the current sectors? And if so, which ones? Should the CHRB be a moving spotlight, so looking at a sector for a few years and then moving on to another sector for a few years and then coming back to the sector potentially to see if there was progress in the meantime. And this takes us to our, uh, to our last poll question for you. Poll question three, if we could get this one up please, that would be great. And here our question for you, is which of the following industries should the CHRB assess next? And the options we've highlighted are hospitality, construction, pharmaceutical industry, travel and tourism, transport and logistics. And again, there is the not sure option uh, for people who don't have a, a clear view on these. Uh, so which one should we, in your opinion, add next? And just to note that the reason we've got these specific sectors uh, pre-selected as options is that they were identified in previous consultations as sectors that present high risks of uh, negative human rights impacts. So this one is a bit more uh, contrasted. I can see we don't have a clear winner, um, but great to see the answers coming in. Just under half people, half of people have voted, so we can keep this one open for a bit longer. 
which industry do you think CHRB should look at next? For now, it's travel, tourism, transport and logistics and construction that are coming out. Travel and tourism with 30%, but there are still votes coming in, so it's still moving around. Great, we've got nearly 80% of people who voted, so that's great. Um, but we can keep the poll open for a few more minutes while I continue. Um, the um, other theme uh, that we welcome comments on is process. So currently the CHRB produces annual benchmarks, publishing all results across the different industries at the same time. And in terms of the, in terms of the research process itself, so we have two research phases and in between we allow companies to review their draft assessment, provide comments uh, before the results are finalised and published. Some questions here would be, should the CHRB continue to be an annual benchmark or move to a two-year publication cycle? Um, do people see benefit in having two years in between each benchmark to give time for companies to drive progress or is it better to maintain of the pressure and incentives on an annual basis. Would you have any concerns with industry specific benchmarks published at different times in the year as opposed to publishing results on all sectors together as we currently do? Um, and do you have comments on the CHRB's benchmark process? So having this back and forth with companies, allowing them to have engagement calls and provide feedback before the results are published. And finally, the last theme is presentation of the results. So I went through the different formats available earlier from company scorecards to the key findings reports. This theme is more relevant for users of the results, but if there are any amongst the audience today, then we're keen to hear from you um, which tools you find most useful and what else you would like to see from the data. Okay, so, um, I realise this is a lot of content with many questions, but again, we know that some people will have comments that focus more on the methodology and others more on the process or the publication timelines. So feel free to pick and choose depending on where your interests lie. Um, I think we can probably end the poll. Um, I can see that we had nearly everyone voting, so that's great. Thank you for that. Um, and travel and tourism was came ahead with 32%, but closely followed by construction, 28%. Um, great, so to get the conversation going, I'm very happy to hand over to Livio to share some comments on what he thinks works well and what could be improved going forward uh, with the CHRB methodology and pro process, um, drawing on your experience and expertise, Livio. So over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. And uh, thank you. I, I had reviewed in advance, I spent a little bit more of time uh, before, uh, before the, the webinar to look at your methodology, to look at the questions. Uh, uh, each of them would probably deserve an answer. And I do have uh, a lot more opinions that I, that I will be able to share this webinar and I'll probably do later. But let me cover, let me cover some of those. Uh, uh, some of those that I, that I picked that where I have stronger um, uh, um, views to share, so to speak. So, and, and, and I'll quote the question, so it's easy for you to. So on question one, for example, where you asked whether the, the CHRB methodology is missing important to topics. Now, let me bring it into Asia. Let me bring it into what was one of the main uh, uh, um, theme of, of our forum over, over the last four days, human rights defenders. Uh, it's, it's a theme which is extremely relevant. I know it's a global theme. Definitely in Asia is a very hot theme. It's definitely a theme uh, uh, against which uh, people want to see also companies reviewed against in terms of how they, they, uh, they treat human rights defenders, how they cooperate with human rights defenders as, as the watchdogs, as those that they can, they can tell the companies what the problems really are. So factoring in how the companies uh, uh, deal with human rights defenders and how they defend them, uh, uh, how they provide remedies and so on is something that I would strongly encourage uh, to do. 
based again on, on what we have heard very vividly in these days. Um, question five uh, on uh, responses to serious allegations should, uh, yeah, definitely should stay in. You're asking whether the response to allegations should, uh, should stay in as, a, as an important criteria. Absolutely. Uh, you, you are basing your, your whole exercise on the UNGPs, uh, and so pillar three should be there. Uh, very, very importantly, it was again reaffirmed by everyone that remedies, unfortunately, is a bit of a forgotten pillar still. Uh, it should not be in, in, in your methodology, so I would certainly advocate for that to be in. On the same question five, you're asking, um, yeah, are we relying too much on company disclosure and does not give enough space for, for perspective of affected individuals? Yes, that is the, still, I have to say, the general feeling uh, that it's uh, perhaps the, the greatest weakness that naturally, unfortunately, your methodology comes with. It does rely a lot on public information. And we all know that uh, human rights utility is based a lot on, on stakeholders' engagement, on hearing the views of the affected community. So the more you can factor in the, 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 the views, the, the gathering the views of the rights holders, the better. I know it's not easy, but sometimes those that are most informed uh, are, are, uh, about you know, what happens is, is those that uh, have less access to, to make their voice heard. And, and sometimes there are language barriers. Sometimes those people are facing intimidation. So you need to have to find a way to, to, to get, uh, to, to be informed by the rights holders. Now, I know it's easier to say and more difficult to do. A few ideas for you on how you could perhaps um, do that. Uh, ideally, open a direct channel with, with them, but of course, that's, that's probably very difficult. Uh, hotlines or things of that type, but you can probably reach out to them a lot through those agencies that have direct contact with them. Yeah. I know the, uh, the, the Business Human Rights Resource Center and IHRB are part of your initiative. They have a lot of contacts. They can certainly channel a, a, a lot of information uh, to you, but perhaps you can go a bit uh, deeper than Business Human Rights Resource uh, Center and connect with those who are connected with the community. If you cannot co connect with the communities uh, directly. Um, another idea for you, um, another player that has, is in contact with the, the communities, in contact with the rights holders, is the national human rights institutions. There are many here in Asia. They have a lot of information. They have a lot of cases that they are collecting about what companies in the regions are doing on the abuses they can be uh, a bridge between you and the rights holders, okay? So if you can't get to the rights holder directly, understand it's difficult, NHRI is perhaps is, is a vehicle for you to get there. And, 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 and I'll say that now, and I'll say it in my closing remarks, uh, we uh, have strong links with NHRIs and, you know, would be happy to try to facilitate this communication with the NHRIs and elaborate more on how you can use national human rights institution. Um, question six, uh, considering removing measurement, uh, team F, transparency. Um, of course, you should not remove transparency, but I agree with you when you say you may not want to have it as a separate one. I see F as a 10% in your methodology, why not place in that into human rights due diligence, which require I would probably broaden human rights due diligence and place transparency within, uh, within uh, criteria B. Um, because, I mean, we know human rights due diligence is about knowing and showing, and to me, showing is the transparency uh, part. Uh, let me go around another one or two. Um, yeah, you should, you're asking and you asked also now whether you should move, uh, be a moving spotlight uh, for a few years and then move to another or, or, or remain on all of that. I have a strong feeling on the fact that you should remain and not move the spotlight because a lot of, of what is interesting of your work is the trajectories that you are showing, the progress or indeed the, the, the regress of the problems. If you, uh, and and you, so if you're not giving us that perspective, we miss a, a great part of, of what we like, at least what I like uh, 
as a practitioner of your work. So don't lose that. Your, your data are, are, are becoming outdated very rapidly. And that's actually the good of it. So the fact that you every year update them and are able to tell us this company is doing better, this company is, is doing less good, it's exactly what we want. So that, I have a very strong feeling on that. Uh, let me end with, the, with the, the, I think it's your last question. Do you use your methodology? Yes, I do. I, I am among those who, who use it uh, to inform our policy work and I do encourage people to use it. Uh, whenever I do it for, for myself and to those who I suggest to, to use it, I, I, I do keep well in mind the caveat that it's mostly based on public uh, available information. Uh, so it, it must be taken with that in mind, right? That it that uh, it might not give the entire picture because the the, the views of, of, of the rights holders uh, are only in part for the very nature of the methodology taken into consideration. Um, I'll leave it at that. Um, thanks, Livio, and thank thanks for taking time out to read through the methodology in a very very busy week for you and very, very insightful comments. Uh, and we are glad that you are using some of the CHRB data in your policy advocacy work as well. Kamil, we do have a couple of questions uh, coming in uh, from the audience. One question is uh, on the process and uh, something to what uh, Livio also uh, alluded to uh, is about stakeholder engagement. How do you ensure that there is uh, stakeholder engagement in uh, the process, uh, which is also something that Libio asks. Uh, I'll just read out the couple of questions and then you can probably try and answer those questions uh, together. The second one is uh, the question of inaccurate disclosures. How does CHRB methodology make sure that if there are inaccurate disclosures, those companies don't end up getting a high score? There's another question coming in. Uh, is on how does the CHRB methodology connect with the SDGs framework? Yeah, I, I would leave those three questions and if you can try and answer those questions uh, uh, in, in your response, that would be great. Great, um, thanks Namit and thank you Livio for all your really insightful comments and really detailed um, and also for not stopping at telling us that we should do something, but also making suggestions for how we might do it, because that's always really precious advice. Um, so going back to the questions, so um, stakeholder engagement and how we make sure that we engage with stakeholders in the process. Um, so stakeholder engagement, I would say, happens mostly when it comes to designing the methodology when we do methodology consultations. So that's when we initially framed the methodology uh, there we had extensive multi-stakeholder consultations with more than I think 400 individuals and organizations um, but also since then we had some regular consultations when we um, updated the methodology or when we developed methodologies for new sectors so when we added ICT manufacturing and automotive and there we always try to get a diverse a set of views, so views from companies and business associations, but also civil society, human rights experts, academics, lawyers, government and, and intergovernmental organizations, um, and where we can um, work with representatives um, and potentially and affected stakeholders. Um, I'd say that this group, the potentially affected and affected stakeholders, is the hardest one to get through. Um, and as Livio said, they're often the best informed and yet the hardest ones to like, have their voices heard. Um, so through methodology consultation, we do this. When we conduct the assessment, most of the direct engagement is with the companies themselves, um, where we have an engagement process where they can review their draft assessment be before it goes public. So to make sure that they can highlight disclosures that um, may have been missed by the research team in the initial research uh, to make sure that when the results do go out, it's an accurate picture of performance. Um, 
And then there's also a lot of stakeholder engagement when it comes to using, uh, we're promoting the results. So um, the key audiences of the results for us would be companies themselves, um, but also investors, investor audiences and governments and then civil society. Um, but we see a lot of um, investor use of the data. So a lot of the stakeholder engagement when it comes to data usage goes with investors. Um, when it comes to the question on inaccurate disclosures and how do we, how can we make sure that the disclosures companies make are um, reliable? So we generally we we believe what well, so we rely on what the companies disclose and say they do. Um, there are a few assumptions behind this, and of course the very simple. Uh, limitation in terms of time and capacity that we can't do research on the ground to verify that every single disclosure by companies is um, kind of approved by these verifications. Um, one assumption is that there would be high risks for companies to disclose information that's not true. Um, and another one is relying on third parties to do these verifications and um, kind of hold companies accountable on, on what they actually say they do. Um, and one challenge we've got here, and this was highlighted before and by a few of the speakers as well, is moving from company disclosure to impact on the ground. Um, and that's still something that's um, kind of a caveat in the approach but also something we need to tackle and then I think if I've got a, a bit of time to answer this third question that Namit you relayed was around the connection between human rights and the SDGs framework um, so as I said earlier the CHRB is now part of the World Benchmarking Alliance um, and the WBA benchmarks companies on their achievement, uh, sorry, on their contribution to achieving the SDGs. Um, the approach that the WBA took um, is to have the social um, element, which of course includes human rights, of the journey to achieving the SDGs at the centre of what we achieve, uh, of what we um, assess. So we we'll, we're assessing 2,000 companies on their contribution to the SDGs on different, in different transformations depending on the sector. Um, but all of these companies are assessed on their um, social performance, so whether they respect human rights. And of course the idea behind this is that we can't achieve the SDGs if um, companies don't respect human rights as kind of a hard floor that we can't for under. Um, so we see this connection as human rights being nearly a, a prerequisite for the achievement of the SDGs. Thanks Camille. Thanks for addressing all the three uh, questions. Uh, with that I would like to now uh, invite Felicitas uh, to give her comments on the presentation. Thank you so much, um, Namit and Camille and Livio. Um, I wanted to start with just to acknowledge um, the things that CHB does do really well, because I think um, for me, it's been really interesting. I've been feeding back into the methodology for, I don't know, five years, more years, I don't even remember now, um, in my current and also previous job. And I think it's such a massive undertaking to measure human rights. It's incredibly challenging and it's incredible achievement to actually do that on so many different human rights topics. And I think the CHB has really, really moved the field forward. Um, the sections that I think work particularly well are you know, where the inclusion of enabling rights like freedom of association and living wage and also the language of enabling rights. I think that works um, quite well for also some of the more conservative audiences we are talking to. Um, also the inclusion of actual allegations, um, actual impact and how companies respond to that, whether they provide remedy, is remedy satisfactory to the victims? I think that's such a powerful element of the CHB. Um, and also something that I think Livio alluded to just to, usability of the data and making it usable for a wide range of audiences. Um, like I've certainly used it a lot. It's in a usable format for others to dissect. It's open source. Uh, many others 
can and have used the methodology um, and also the alignment with the UNGPs and international framework, keeping that very tight alignment um, is just incredibly effective in highlighting major gaps on due diligence, for example. Um, in terms of what, um, where there is, where I see opportunities or we see opportunities um, for improvement, I think um, from the resource center we would also just think about that in terms of what is it that we want to achieve in the asia pacific region and i think for us a big piece here is um, just china and their belt and road initiative and the massive influence that has globally and just thinking how we can inject human rights in there more strongly <clears throat> um, and you know thinking about the fact that obviously the initiative is dependent on a very benign image that you know comparison between different asian markets might have a stronger impact, but also thinking around um, at the research center, we've been reaching out to, you know, Chinese companies about allegations of abuse where we typically get a lot lower response rate, but where we do get responses to quality is often much higher. So it's not coming from a PR department, but actually for those responsible for um, human rights. So just to seeing if we can build on that in some way. Um, and then I think there was also a question in the consultation around should we, you know, go beyond policy and I think that's certainly something I would strongly advocate for. So I think there's this section A that works really well, you know, having having commitments to the fundamental rights is so important and I would definitely keep that but I've, I've did sort of a word check and I think the word commit came up 279 times in the methodology and just thinking through where in other sections of the methodology that could be cut out and we really focus more on practices. So for example, Freedom for Association has a section on, you know, does the company commit to not interfere with rights of workers to unionize, um, you know, just moving beyond and asking the company, for example, to give examples of what did they do when you know those rights were infringed upon for example or focusing more on the other element that's already there that looks at percentage of workforce that's unionized and i think similarly on on remedy of allegations for example you know i think at the moment a quarter of the scores goes to has the company a policy in place on that topic um you know to me that's the policies are covered in section a and really i would want to see here just a full and strong focus on remedy and and the victims um, and then I think, as Livio has alluded to, obviously sort of the holy grail certainly also for us would be really measuring impact um, on the ground, going beyond disclosure. I still do think for sort of lower and mid scoring companies, um, you know, looking at disclosure already helps to identify so easily who who are the worst ones and sort of pushing for some key policies that is still important. So I, you know, I think one thing we've been trying to think around this as well is maybe at least to start with, we could also focus just on the, you know, even the 10 largest companies or alternatively, anyone that say reaches over 70 or 60% of the benchmark that these companies really then have to demonstrate and be able to provide data and views from rights holders, right? And I think one thing, way to think about this is A, it could be that you just push it back to the companies and say, okay, it's your responsibility to provide that data, right? Rather than ours to somehow find it. If you can't find it, you can never score above a certain threshold. Um, the other thing, of course, would be, you know, to think about in the apparel sector, for example, a clean clothes campaign is thinking about building out wage data for different countries, you know, or is there a way that, you know, we could look at, at least if it's a... Sorry, Philip. Or, yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, is there a way to get feedback from unions in at least three sourcing countries, for example, or, or thinking through some technology tools? Um, and the last thing I just wanted to mention is I think what's been really helpful for us is just thinking through the corporate disclosure that probably will remain an element always, but just thinking that through from an, the perspective of impacted stakeholders and also key users. So, you know, from a worker perspective, maybe thinking through maybe there should be higher weighting for the enabling factors like freedom for association, like living wages. Um, what Livio mentioned for human rights defenders, areas that focus on human rights defenders, but also things like a supplier list, right? That allows um, worker organization to hold companies accountable, but is equally, I think, useful for investors that, that can see where is the company sourcing from, where are the risks. Um, and also, yeah, thinking about 
key indicators for investors. I think you mentioned before, um, focus on board remuneration being linked to human rights. I think that's something investors are really interested on and it links really well with the, it's very indicative of the overall score. Um, also response to allegations is something we've seen a lot of interest from investors in. So just maybe thinking about these key data points and could they be weighted more highly. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Felicitas, for these comments. I think these are very, very specific and helpful for us. Uh, Camille, we have a couple of questions and I'll try and read uh, that out to you. So one is, uh, and actually it's part of the same question. So there is a trust deficit between government uh, on, and, and businesses probably on one side and then human right defenders, civil society organization. And there are also a lot of policies, guidelines and, and laws. Uh, so the question is how to ensure harmony and coherency in rules uh, and regulations. Uh, and how do you make sure that uh, the stakeholders are able to then come together and engage in these processes to make it more uh, effective uh, in, in, in that sense. So uh, if you can try and address this question and, and, and also I think it links back to uh, the question around stakeholder engagement that both Livio and Felicitas uh, spoke of. Uh, if you can try and address this uh, question uh, in terms of how is it already happening and uh, what can be done better. Great, so, thank you Nimit. It's a really good question. Actually I think a few questions in one. Um, so I see the point on the trust deficit between government and business on one side and civil society um, on the other and how to ensure harmonization in rules and regulation and then how to make sure that there's um, a more trusting relationships between those different stakeholder groups. So on the trust deficit point, um, <laughs> definitely this is something we see but um, also it's quite different depending on the um, region or the country um, so based on consultations that we do in different locations we can see that in some cases it's much easier to have different stakeholder groups all together in one room um, and make suggestions on the methodology etc in some um, circumstances and contexts it's actually better to keep some of these separate um, so that's there's a kind of context specific component to this um, the harmonization point um, so we're seeing more and more um, regulation around human rights mandatory disclosure um, and there's there are discussions at the EU level but also in other regions to have mandatory human rights due diligence uh, disclosures coming in force um, in the near future um, and it's great to see all these developments because if anything what the CHRB findings show is that the voluntary approach has very clear limits um, but one concern then that we hear from many companies especially companies with global footprints that actually operate in many jurisdictions is that if this regulation is not somewhat harmonized then they're going to end up having to disclose uh, about human rights due diligence or other topics but with different asks depending on the jurisdiction and where they operate in several different ones then it will be hard to reconcile them so as we're still relatively early on in this um, great kind of momentum that's building it's good to keep that standardization and harmonization in mind that's for sure um, and then making sure that different stakeholder groups can have come together and go beyond this trust deficit point. Um, that's one thing that the WBA um, is really trying to promote through its work, through the Alliance particularly. This week we had the um, Alliance, Assem Alliance Assembly, which takes place every year where we try to get different stakeholders um, think about issues this year that theme was resilience um, connected of course to the coronavirus pandemic um, but yeah the kind of idea behind this is that when it comes to um, global and systemic issues like achieving the sustainable development goals respecting human rights one stakeholder on its own will never manage to resolve the problem so that's when we need to find 
common language and common platforms for these different stakeholders to come together and have a conversation. So again, it's always easier said than done, but hopefully the work of organizations like the WBA, but also forums like this one today um, and this week can, can help in this regard. Thanks, Camille. Hopefully Thanks I for address different points and packing the question. <laughs> Yes, thank you. I think that's uh, that covers all the three parts of the question. With that, I would like to now uh, invite Hiroshi uh, for his comments on the presentation. Okay, thank you, Namit. Yes, um, as I live in Japan, so when it comes to this, when I saw this corporate human rights benchmarks, I need to first came up my mind that I have to translate from English to Japanese. So. I don't know how many times I read this benchmark. So after I have done this work and I just brought some of the company's board members and I found out that some of the board members thought that this is really interesting the way they put up this methodology and scope and process. When I come and sit together with the board members, it was just like their decision-making process to identify their potential risk from their business strategies from 2030, 2050, when they're backcasting their issues. When you see and read this uh, scope of these questions, that gives a big opening their eyes and gave them, oh, this is really like our decision-making process, but it's very hard. But you have to find this is a good sort of the Bible to go step by step. So I think the methodology and the scope of these um, ideas, I think it still works for this, even the business industry as well. But when it comes to this uh, scores of this, my point is my comment is that human right due diligence and the remedy, they are both, they have a score is 25% and remedy is 15%. But when I saw some of the companies, when we worked together, I think at this moment, 25% 25% of the human right due diligence procedures, I think it's totally understood. And the remedy is 15. But when it comes to like five years later, when the company accomplish the due diligence procedures, I think this methodology should focus more on the remedy scheme. And that gives you a higher score because then the company will feel much more comfortable to identify their risk from their suppliers. Because when you have a 25% remedy, they just only find maybe three or four human rights issue and they say, this is comfortable, we have done it. And they get like 10% for the policy and 25% of uh, due diligence totally is like 30% or 35%. That gives you comfortable for the company. They don't need to reach 50% or 60%. But if you, maybe in the future, there is a time for like a different ratio to think about get higher average. Maybe we need to think about a little bit of how you disclose your information and how you accomplish this remedy scheme is much more uh, vitally important for these activities of the UN guiding principle to implement into their business strategies. And the last one is about how in order to engage more strongly with the corporation, I think the CEO commitment is really important. But most of the CEO, what they are concerned is their stock price. So if this methodology works for this finding issue and related to their intangible asset, I think in the future, it will be very interesting to know how many like um, investors, uh, how many like ESG investors really using this methodology as an, a benchmark to refer to their decision making, whether to purchase this company or not then it's much more the company itself get more strongly committed. At this level, I saw many 
I came from the banking sectors and I saw some of the ESG investors, they created their own methodology with 200, 300 companies. And there's so many like on the methodology, even among the banking system in the financial sectors. So when the WBA is creating this kind of a huge, like a seven transformation of this big ideas, I think it's very important how this result could be used for the financial sectors or even the stakeholders when they are monitoring and benchmarking this kind of the methodology. So that's how this result can be used. I think it's going to be the very important a trigger for the companies to get more higher scores. Thank you. Thank you, Hiroshi. And it's very uh, heartening to know that uh, there is similarity in how decision making happens in boardrooms with the way the methodology is being designed. So I think that's always a good thing to, uh, to know. Uh, and, and thank you for all the other insightful comments uh, that you just uh, shared with us. Uh, we do have a couple of more minutes. So if there are any further questions, uh, please feel free to just put it in the chat box uh, uh, and, and we'll be happy to answer those uh, questions. If not, uh, we'll, uh, and, and, okay, so we'll, we'll then move uh, to the final uh, part of uh, uh, this. Okay, someone has a suggestion and a comment. Um, would you like to type your comment or suggestion in the chat box, Sinisa? Okay, I think if, if someone can just uh, help uh, in unmuting Sinisa. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I'm sorry for jumping in like this. Uh, I'm uh, part of Libio's team. I'm a global business and human rights specialist for the UNDP. Um, I also, as it happens, have an academic background in, in uh, benchmarking and so on. So I just have a, a couple of quick suggestions, uh, you know, comments, uh, I guess, um, with regard to the methodology and how it's used. Uh, it strikes me that you're sitting on a very rich data set, you know, in terms of both, uh, you know, obviously temporarily over time and in, with various data points. And the, the one thing that I think, you know, you could, I mean, obviously changes in the methodology and so on are welcome, but I think it would be really great to see you use it to uh, attribute causation, to see what, change, what causes changes to be made. Uh, so, you know, you referred to some of it just now and earlier in the presentation when you said that, you know, for instance, you noticed a, a, a correlation between um, the pay of, uh, you know, board directors and the level of compliance with human rights. Uh, but I would think that, you know, obviously this is more work, <laughs> but I would think that, you know, you could uh, probably draw a, a useful uh, correlation at least and possibly causation if you do maybe some quality research on, um, you know, for instance, the introduction of new laws and the scores in your benchmark, uh, the, you know, um, new uh, cases being prosecuted before courts and your scores. So it could be, you know, legal factors, it could be economic factors, obviously, wage stagnation, uh, level of trade, et cetera, et cetera. It right. could be, you know, simply like, um, um, it, it could essentially even be uh, <laughs> attendance at forums like this, um, where, whereby, you know, perhaps exposure to uh, the business human rights discourse and so on. Uh, I mean, I'm, you know, this, this is obviously off the top of my head, but I would imagine there's quite a, uh, you know, a lot of endogenous, exogenous, so external and internal factors that you could look at. You alluded to some of them, the country of origin, industry, but I think there was probably a lot more. And in that way, your data could be even more useful. And one other thing where I would think, what I would imagine would be easy for you, um, and, you know, you could see how you influence things, is actually to think of yourself yourselves your benchmarking process as an independent external variable 
So I'm just wondering, looking at this over time, how much the fact that you are working on this has impacted companies? And a way to actually do that, I mean, methodologically sound way would be, and I don't know if this is like, you know, uh, just an academic kind of um, uh, look at things, but I would think that a way to do things, uh, to do this methodologically would be actually to have a control group. So to have a certain number of companies that you're not going to look at over the next two years and yes. two three years how you know let them know and then see what happens over time and see if your benchmarking the fact that you are looking at them so external scrutiny has any impact on you know their scores okay thanks very much thanks thanks for your very valid suggestions uh, so with, with that i think uh, we are almost out of time and i would like to uh, now invite livio for uh, his final comments Thank you, Namit. Uh, I think people have, have heard my voice a lot, so I'll, I'll, I'll be very short. I'll, I'll close with three uh, key, uh, three, three, three uh, sort of lessons that I, that I, that I jotted down on, on a piece of paper based on the conversation we've had today. Um, the first one is that you obviously have put a lot of work. I mean, it's so obvious you put a lot of work into coming up with this methodology. It's a pity that, that, that a consultation like this you know, it has to be only 90 minutes. I, I really would have loved to be in a much longer conversation, in a workshop, in whatever form uh, you'd be able to do it in the past. Keep that discussion going because uh, it's a great methodology, can be perfected. Um, give the time to people to, to um, come in with comments like mine and, and, and the, the even more detailed and informed one, for example, the Sinitsa uh, shared. Uh, the second, of course, is about the stakeholder inputs that we all uh, uh, noted. I, I, I wanted to say that I like very much the idea that Felicitas made on, on perhaps asking those at the top of the list to have a greater uh, burden of the proof or, or, or to make sure that they, if they really want to reach the highest of the scores, uh, are able to uh, show that 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 score is deserved by by confirming it through data that comes directly from the stakeholders uh, a third is a suggestion for you uh, uh, being a, a, a fan of, of of what benchmarking means and i hope will mean more in the future of this in human rights you know that there is a project starting uh, uh, in a few weeks uh, on the next decade of business in human rights this is started by the UN Working Group of Business and Human Rights. Uh, UNDP will be uh, also a big part of implementing it in the region. There's going to be a lot of consultation, one year of consultations throughout the world, you know, at all levels on how should the future look like. Seize the opportunity of bringing in the benchmarking aspect of it, which I think is very relevant not known enough to all, all the stakeholders. And I, and I, as I said at the beginning, uh, uh, it, it has an impact on all levels, right? On policy, on remedies, on everything, on human rights due diligence. So I do suggest you to um, uh, connect with that process. And, uh, and of course, what I can promise is that to the extent we will be uh, linked to that pro process, and I know we will because I'm in touch with Dante who will be running it. We will make space for, for benchmarking to be part of that discussion in, in the regions where uh, we will organize uh, dialogues. Uh, I'll leave it at that and thank you very much. Thank you, okay, Livio. Thank you. With that, over to you, Camille. <laughs> thank you, Nimit. Uh, thank you, Livio. Yeah, I just wanted to thank um, everyone before closing. Thank you to the speakers, um, to the audience, and to the team, to the meet, and also the technical team in the background, um, and yeah, to the audience and everyone for bearing with us in spite of the technical difficulties in the beginning. Um, we really value all your feedback, so it was great to hear from you, and we are going to continue the conversations, Livio, as you said. Um, so for anyone who's interested in knowing more, uh, please get in touch with us. Um, you can check our website, corporatebenchmark.org, um, and we'd be very happy to take these conversations forward. So thank you, everyone.
Yeah, thank you everyone. And thank you so much for your patience, both the participants and the organizers. Um, again, really sorry that we had to start so late. Thank you all. Thank you, Namit and Camille. Thank you, Hiroshi. Bye-bye.